Well, good morning, church family, and a very special Happy Mother's Day to all the moms that are watching this morning. You know, I hope you've had a morning that's been filled with breakfast in bed and special gifts and, and homemade cards and everything else that really does celebrate all that you mean to those in your life. Just a little later on, we're going to be opening up our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be looking at an interesting encounter that Jesus had with a mother who had in many ways hit rock bottom. Everything in her life had fallen apart for her, and then Jesus walked in. It seemed rather appropriate to talk about this particular encounter this morning because we all know that we've had a year unlike any other year. And mothers have been relied on for things that they have seldom needed to do before. And we want you to know that that has not gone unnoticed and that we all appreciate the love and the sacrifice that you have given. You know, Jesus offered some powerful, powerful words of hope and encouragement to the mom that we're going to look at. And it's our hope that his words will offer to you encouragement and hope as well. You know, in just a few minutes, we've also got a special kids story. But just before that, would you join us as we open our service with some worship? And I want to say good morning to all of you as well, and especially to you mothers on your special day. I have a scripture reading to start with this morning. It's probably familiar to most of you. It's Psalm 34, the first four verses. And it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. And that's a good word for us today and especially for mothers. And so as we sing this morning, maybe boys and girls, you want to have your mom just listen to you sing along with us and that'll be your little special present for her. But let's all worship the Lord together this morning. Sing now with voices 
Good morning, kids, and it is great to have you with us as well watching this service this morning. You know, I hope that you've had a chance today to remind your mom of just how thankful you are for her and how much you love her. But if you maybe forgot to do that, you have my permission to get up right now to go and press pause on this video and to tell her, and we'll wait for you, okay? You know, this morning in our message, we're going to be hearing a story about how Jesus restored hope to a mother by raising her son from the dead. But you know, before we do that, Douglas has some really good thoughts on what it means to honor our moms. Take a look at this. My mom is awesome. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and today I wanted to talk to you about Mother's Day. Yeah, and how we can honor our mothers how we can honor our moms. Now for me and my family on Mother's Day, we like to show my mom how much we love her because she does so much for us. She really does. She does so much for my family. And so on Mother's Day, we, we let her sleep in and we give her breakfast in bed and we write cards for her and we get her little gifts and, and we try to do all these nice things to show her how special she is to us. And you know, it's interesting because in the Bible, you probably know this, but in the Ten Commandments, it says that we should honor our father and mother. And that's the first commandment with a promise. It says that if we do that, if we honor our fathers and mothers, then things will go well for us. But usually when people are talking about the Ten Commandments and they get to the honor your father and mother part, they say, you know, obey your parents. And if you honor your mother, then you're going to be obeying her. So that makes sense. But you can totally obey somebody without honoring them. And that's not what God wants. God wants us to honor our father and mother. You know, my neighbor's cat is the worst. I usually think of myself as a dog person, but I've known several cats that I really liked. But not my neighbor's cat. He is so gross. He always knocks over our trash cans and gets in the garbage and eats it. And he always makes a huge mess. It's disgusting. And if we hear a trash can get knocked over, we always open the window and say, Hey, get out of here, cat! And he'll always obey us, but he always does it real sassy. Right? You know, he doesn't talk, but if he could talk, he would totally be like, yeah, fine, whatever. I'll get out of here. I didn't want your garbage anyways. <laughs> yeah, so he like obeys us, but he doesn't really care about us at all. If he honored us, if he cared about us, then he would, you know, not knock over our trash cans. Or if he did, he'd at least apologize. And so honoring your mom is a lot more than just obeying her. When you honor your father and mother, you are valuing them highly. You're being grateful for them. You are respecting them. You care about what they say and how they feel. And so the stuff we do for my mom on Mother's Day is totally an example of honoring our mothers. But we should be doing that all the time. Now, maybe we can't do all the things that we do for my mom on Mother's Day. Maybe we can't do those things every day. But when I sit down to write the Mother's Day card for my mom, I always feel really grateful for her because she's done so much for me. And I get this really happy feeling inside because I really love my mom. And you know, on Mother's Day, we pull out all the stops. We do all the nice things for my mom. And so maybe we couldn't do Mother's Day every single day, but every day we can show my mom that we love her. Every day I can show my mom that I respect her and honor her. It's not just about obedience, it's about love and respect. And so that's my challenge to you guys today is that you would honor your mothers. Not just on Mother's Day, but every day. Because if you do, things will go really well for you. It's the first command with a promise. Our moms are amazing. So let's look for ways this week that we can show them love and respect and honor. Hey guys, happy Mother's Day. And you know, on Mother's Day, it can be kind of a hard day for some people, right? Because not all of us have moms that are there for us. Not all of us even know who our moms are. But I think that on Mother's Day, we can show honor not just to, you know, our 
moms, but also to the women in our life who have been there for us. And we should be thankful for the women that God has put in our life that have helped us along the way, that have been there for us. You know, maybe you've got a teacher or, or your grandma or your aunt or a neighbor. I want you to think this week not just of ways that you can show your mom honor and respect, but how can you honor the godly women that Jesus has put into your life? Isn't that a great reminder for all of us? Okay, kids, we have a special word of the week for you to be listening for today. And like always, we want you to count the number of times you hear this word in this morning's message, write it down, have your parents email me the number, and we have a special gift that we'll be delivering to your door this week. Okay, are you ready? Today's word is mother. Enjoy the message. I can't even begin to imagine what that mother must have been going through prior to her encounter with Jesus. You know, nowadays, I think we tend to throw around the term rock bottom almost flippantly, but this woman, in a lot of ways, would have embodied that phrase. This morning, we want to take a deeper look at the encounter that she had with Jesus. And on the surface, it might appear that the son was the, the major recipient of Jesus' compassion. 
But in reality, as we're going to see, it was the mother. It's often surprised me that this isn't a more well-known passage of the New Testament. Maybe it's because it's sandwiched between the, the story of Jesus healing the centurion's servant and an especially interesting encounter that Jesus had with some of John the Baptist's followers. But it is a powerful and thought-provoking interaction. I honestly don't remember ever in my life hearing a message on this passage before either. And I know that I've read it, but I don't know that I've ever really paid that much attention to it. But one of the things that I, I truly love about this encounter is that it again illustrates that when Jesus encounters real pain and real hurt and real suffering, that he is moved by it. I mean, whether it's, it's Mary and Martha's grief at their brother's tomb, which caused Jesus to actually cry and were told to be moved in his spirit. You know, whether it's a, an outcast leper or a man born blind, you know, a woman who had an ongoing illness that had really fa financially bankrupted her, or a demon-possessed man in a graveyard. Jesus' heart, it goes out to broken people because he knows that it's the sin and the God of the world that creates that chaos and that pain and that death. And Jesus knows that God the Father's plan was for something very different than that. James says, pure and faultless religion is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress. And that's true because neither orphans or widows could ever give back those things that you do for them. There's no quid pro quo here. You are loving someone for the sake of loving someone who needs it, and that's it. And in the encounter that we're looking at today, it's about a mother who truly needed that kind of love. So this story happens just after Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we have just spent 15 weeks going through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, which was three chapters long. But in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, it is less than one chapter long. And in Luke's version, it's found in chapter 6. And then in chapter 7, Jesus heals the centurion's servant before he moves on to the next town. And the name of that next town is really where a lot of the events that we're looking at today take place. The name of that town is Nain. And it's interesting that that name means pleasant or beautiful or delightful. The city of Nain was about 25 miles from Capernaum, where Jesus was at the beginning of Luke chapter 7. So the walk would have likely taken roughly eight hours or what was considered to be a full day's journey. So I want you to picture this with me. Jesus and his crowd of followers are heading into the city of Nain as another crowd meets them on their way out of the city of Nain. And it's almost as if these two crowds are about to collide. The first crowd was there because of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is followed by his 12 disciples, but there is also a lot of other people that are following him as well. He, as we've just mentioned, has just given them some, some very inspired teaching and then Jesus heals the servant of this centurion without even seeing or touching them. So it's probably fair to assume that this crowd that was following Jesus is buzzing with excitement and anticipation of, of what is it that Jesus is going to do next. The second crowd is at the city gate. And this particular crowd certainly isn't as loud or excited as the crowd that's around Jesus, but instead... This crowd is heartbroken. This crowd is sad. This crowd is, is mourning. And there was likely crying and wailing because this crowd was made up of a funeral procession. In fact, this is how we're told that all of this plays out in Luke 7, starting in verse 11. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. You know, Jewish burial places were always situated 
some distance outside of their cities. They also had different customs for carrying out those who were about to be buried, and it all depended on their age. For example, a, a child under a month old was always carried out in the arms of a person, usually the parent. If the child was a full month old, it would be put in a, a very small coffin, which was carried out in someone's arms. If a child had reached 12 months old, they were carried out in a little coffin on someone's shoulder. And if the child was anywhere between the ages of 1 and 18, well, they were put out in what was called a briar or a beer, as some people call it, or a bed. And as if that wasn't bad enough that her only son had died, we're also told that this woman was a widow. She had no husband, and she had no, really, nobody to look after her. She was completely without resources. You know, the way that the, the family unit survived back in the ancient Middle East was always through the work of the men. The women could do things around the home, but they weren't legally allowed to even make money. The men provided the income and the necessities that the family units needed to live. And in the absence of a father, or in this woman's case, her husband, the responsibility for providing for the family landed squarely on the shoulders of her son. The responsibility for putting food on the table landed squarely on the shoulders of her son. The responsibilities for paying the bills landed on the shoulders of this son. And the responsibility for representing the family in the temple well, that too landed squarely on the shoulders of this woman's son. The son had most likely been supporting the mother in every way imaginable. The son had most likely been her means of survival and her hope for the future. And with her husband gone and now her only son gone, she would be in a very difficult place. I think that Luke tells us some of these smaller details about this woman and her situation in order to paint a picture of just how desperate a situation she was really in. I think that Luke tells us these details to help us, us, the reader, to understand the weight that this crowd would have felt as they walked beside her, supporting her, but probably also questioning what her future would and could hold. And Jesus and his crowd noticed this funeral procession coming towards them. And I imagine that they probably reverently stepped aside. I imagine that they had such a, a large crowd that they probably had to split into two and kind of part like the Red Sea and let this woman and her mourning crowd walk right between them. I imagine that most people from, probably from both crowds, would have found this moment to be a little bit awkward. I mean, Jesus' crowd might even have been a, a bit embarrassed or mortified for having been laughing and, and joking. And then all of a sudden, they're trying to be quiet and respectful because of this family's loss. Or would this mother, you wonder, uh, I wonder, and some of the people in her crowd maybe felt as if they were ruining the day for these people that seemed so excited. They were sad, but then to interfere and walk through a gathering of joyful people, well, that adds just a little extra frustration and challenge to their grieving. And I imagine that it's Jesus that breaks the awkward silence with his words. This passage continues, and in verse 13, Luke tells us this, tells us, when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said to her, don't cry. So just think about that for a moment. Jesus is telling this grieving woman to stop crying. You know, the Greek word that we translate as cry in this passage more accurately means to wail, and it, it paints this, this tragic picture of a woman who is so overcome with her grief that she can't even speak. All she can do is wail. And maybe you're like me in that when you read this, 
You'd be curious to know how this dialogue, this full dialogue, actually played out. Because on the surface, it sounds as if Jesus is telling her to, to stop wailing or to stop mourning. We also don't know when in this interaction that he said these words. But I have to believe that Jesus said these words with some power and some spiritual authority attached to it. I mean, when he healed the centurion's servant just a few verses earlier, he did it from miles and miles away. In fact, as the passage tells us, he, that being Jesus, was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But say the word and my servant will be healed. This crowd that would have been around Jesus hearing his response to what the centurion sent. They would have heard Jesus' words with a kind of spiritual authority that would have left them frozen. You know, I, I wonder if that's what's happening to this mother as well in this moment. You know, it's obvious that Jesus was, was touched by her pain and he was impacted by her situation and he was moved by her backstory. In fact, he was so moved that he didn't even wait for her to respond to what he said. But instead, we're told that he walks right up to the body of her deceased son. He reaches out and touches him, and he gives this lifeless body life. We're told in verse 14 that this is what takes place. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on. That's like a stretcher. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up, began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. I mean, we don't pick up on a lot of what likely is really happening here, but it is likely that Jesus has just thrown both of these crowds into a, a bit of a theological frenzy. See, Jewish people were not supposed to touch dead things. In fact, this would have been considered an action that would have made Jesus ceremonially unclean. I mean, people just, they just didn't do this. They shouldn't. They couldn't, according to the Jewish law. And you can almost assume the tension in the people that are watching this because they're watching Jesus, this great Jewish teacher, break the Jewish law by touching this dead body. And then seeing with their own eyes this lifeless body regain life again. You wonder if the crowd that was following Jesus was just waiting, you know, in anticipation to see what was Jesus going to do next. I mean, Jesus had done impossible and incredible things before. But he certainly had never done anything even close to raising somebody from the dead before. And I love how first... Verse 15 records the specifics of what happened. And this was not a mistake. This was intentionally written to us. Because verse 15 says, The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. You know, what an incredible Mother's Day gift that was. Now, moms, you might have gotten breakfast in bed this morning or maybe some handmade crafts or a handmade card. But this mother had her hope and her future restored. For this mother, there was probably no other day in her entire life that even came close to comparing with this one. It was the day of her son's funeral. It was supposed to take place that day, but Jesus decided to cancel it. And instead, they celebrated together this rebirth, this new life. But Jesus did something else that, this day, and I don't want us to lose sight of this. You know, Jesus brought these two crowds who were going in different directions together. He joined them together, and they were now moving in the same direction. There was no longer a need for the funeral procession to take place. There was no longer a need for the crowd to head to the cemetery outside of the city. Now these two groups could join together and enter into the city and celebrate together that Jesus 
had done something amazing. And you know, Mother's Day can truly bring out two different crowds of people. Some of you moms are likely very excited about today. I mean, Mother's Day is a very special day for you. Many mothers are ready for a day of, of pampering and well-deserving of it. I mean, they're ready for a few of those handmade gifts. And there are children enthusiastic about telling their moms how much they're loved and how special they are. And the kids can't wait to cook that special meal to clean their room and, and maybe there's something else in your family. You fill in the blank. But you know, then there's that other crowd. That other crowd that, that comes to this Mother's Day with less enthusiasm. You know, actually, it wouldn't surprise me if, if some of those women in this category, in this crowd, choose to skip even watching church today because they just don't feel like they have anything to celebrate in this area. In fact, when other people celebrate, sometimes it causes them pain. You know, they may be mourning or hurting today. You know, there may be other people missing someone today, and it's a, a reminder that that special person just isn't there for them anymore. Some may not like today because their mother maybe wasn't the woman that they needed them to be. Maybe their mother has hurt them instead of encouraging them to grow. So today, all it is is just a, another reminder of what they missed out on. And still others might mourn this day because they have longed to be a mother for one reason or another. That has just not been something that has happened. Whatever your situation, my prayer for all of us today is that those two crowds who are watching this would leave joyfully together. Now, I hope those who are excited for this Mother's Day will also be mindful of those who have a tough time with the day. Maybe you'll look for ways to encourage and lift up and include those who are struggling today. I also pray for those who struggle uh, that you might look for a way that Jesus might enter in to your situation, much like he did with this woman, and bring you the joy and the hope that maybe some of you have simply lost. I know that he will not hesitate to meet you wherever you are at this morning and know that it's okay to be hurt and frustrated and sad. Just know that you're never alone and maybe this Mother's Day can be a turning point for you. Most of all, I want all of us to recognize that when Jesus saw the broken heart of this mother, he did something about it. He was moved to offer a miracle. And there's something about a mother's heart that really connected with Jesus' heart. And I believe that's true today as well. God's heart for his children is full of unconditional love and grace. And this is also at the core of what it means to be a godly mother. And as people, we don't always live that out in a perfect way. But God's unconditional love is something truly amazing that he offers to all of us. And it's our prayer today that this would be an honoring day for those of you who are, are mothers with kids, but also those who are celebrating uh, the mother that has raised you. Also, we pray that it would be a day when, uh, if this is a day of pain for you, that Jesus would meet you in a very special way and provide hope and joy in the midst of what you're experiencing. Would you bow with me as we pray? Lord, I want to thank you for this powerful story. And uh, uh, I thank you for the love and for the passion and the, the concern that you carried for this woman and for the way that you tangibly looked for a way to reach out to her and uh, turn her sorrow into joy. I thank you that you do that today as well, Lord. Maybe not through raising uh, our, our children from the dead, but Lord, you do that in other ways. And uh, I'm so grateful to you, Jesus, that you are a God who 
is not far away and distant, but you are a God who is near to us when we are hurting, when we are struggling, when we are needing to hear something from you. I thank you that you promise that you will be closer to us than a brother in those moments. Thank you that we've been able to uh, be taught through this experience. And I pray that we would, um, we would apply what we have learned today to those in our lives. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Thank you.